Thanks for listening to another episode of the Gifted Performance Podcast. If you're listening or watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, as well as hitting the like button and the notification bell so you never miss a video. If you prefer audio format, search Gifted Performance on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting service, and subscribe today. Make sure you also rate and review the podcast, as that helps us out tremendously. Enjoy the podcast, and stay gifted. Welcome back. Another episode. Body composition. Q&A. What are we on now? Number 17. Guys, we're almost at 20. We are almost at drinking age of episodes that we've done here. Well, Go in Canada, us. you could drink here. Oh, we are Canadian. We're getting Canadian drunk, according Just to Dom. Molson 3.0s? What is 6.0? Molson? Is that like beer? It is a beer. Yeah, it's Canadian it? beer, but is yeah, it, good? it has more alcohol. Uh, it's like freshman in college. Good. You okay. Know, like you can't, so it could you like can't be get any other beer. Like Natty, in the loosest like Natty interpretation Lights. of the world. It's, it's, it's good. <laughs> You've been to Tim Hortons. Yeah. Mm. That's fu- it's fucking Dunkin Donuts. We have I lot, won't we accept have otherwise. It's Dunkin Donuts. It's nothing special. Jimmy and I went there. I think we got like a dozen donuts to eat because we were just really trying to fuck ourselves up one day. Just, just sampling donuts. every single one of them. So underwhelmed. So underwhelmed. My friend owns one right by us. Your friends own everything. <laughs> Dom's like Dom friend, Joe Biden, that friends. owns the world. <laughs> uh, now we're definitely getting demonetized. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to work out well. All right. On today's questions, when you see me looking up here, it's because I got them on my other screen back there. Uh, we've got a nutrition setting macros question. We've got a supplement question. We've got a question about night sweats getting sweaty um and we also got a question about hrt another question about hrt more of a broad scope question though any pieces of information that you guys want to get out there before we get going projects that you're working on things that you're gonna be throwing up there on the gifted store soon things you want to plug paul has decided that he's gonna look or try to look like he gives a shit on podcasts now paul what is your Three-step plan to looking I like you give a shit. I didn't say that I was going to try. I said I needed to try. Okay, like so we're I not. Need to, I need to so try. So in the like trans-theoretical model, that five-stage model towards action, Paul is still in the contemplation phase. He's contemplating giving a shit. He's just not oh. in that like preparation phase where he's going to like put an action plan together. You could probably say that about a lot of the things that I should probably do. <laughs> You know, probably. I think it's, yeah. I, all the time, I'm like, man, I should probably start doing this, and that's the end of it, man. That's where it, that's where it stops. Here's a plug. I think, I think we got some of these shirts left. If you're a size double extra large, go pick one up. It's a nice, comfy shirt. Makes my breasts look nice. Shoulders are looking well developed. All good in the hood over here. Or a medium. I'm being told we also have mediums. However, or also, if you would like to let people know that you are going to keep showing up, go and pick up one of the J. Lee collections. If you're a client of Dom's or not, and you find that you are often very cold, plenty of Team Kuza sweaters on the rack. Hey, it's going to get cold here soon. Sweet. We should do like, like, if we're trying to appeal to everyone, also the opposite of all our shirts. So like a shirt that says like, just go home. <laughs> or like, just give up. Go back to bed. Try again no tomorrow. Chance. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> no chance. All right. Your best demotivating shirt. Demotivating Deplorable. but realistic shirt ideas. Just like Deplorable below. right across. The <laughs> Probably should, but won't. All right, our first question comes from Daniela Baez, and she's got an easy Instagram tag. It's at Daniela Baez. Uh, Daniela asks, what's the science behind setting your starting macros and then making adjustments? So Jay is especially equipped to start this one off as he just dropped his second lecture on estimating and establishing maintenance calories in the mentoring lab. Go sign up for the mentoring lab. So let's let him kick things off. Whoa. Okay. 
I, All right. What is the science? I want you to lead us through like a, a whole meta analysis. Paul, is your name Jay? <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> Please don't mansplain to him. Let the man go. I am a little bit offended here. My Paul mansplain <laughs> as if I can't take this question on on my own. Uh, but what's the science behind starting macros and making adjustments? So I'll usually the first thing would be to uh, set or determine maintenance caloric intake would probably be the best place to start because we have to, you know, before we can get somewhere, we kind of have to figure out where we are now. So that would probably be the best place to start in the whole science of uh, starting macros. <clears throat> and so I, you can get a lot of these things inside the mentoring lab, which you can sign up for at www.giftofperformance.com. Uh, but how I typically, I, I, you can go a number of ways. You can use an equation, which often will sometimes get you close-ish, maybe. It's a very rough estimate. I'm a bigger fan of sort of observing things. So I'll have somebody track their scale weight and then also track their macros for about seven to 10 days. That'll give me a good idea of whether or not their scale weight is staying at one place, eating X amount of calories, or if it's increasing or decreasing. The only issue with that is typically if you have someone track their food and they've never done it before, they're going to adjust their nutritional intake. So that's the tricky part with that. So that's kind of where I would start is determining uh, maintenance in one way, shape, or form. And then usually how I make adjustments, uh, usually I try to set, if we're going to talk about setting macros, so I'll set their protein somewhere close-ish to one gram per pound of scale weight if they're sort of a, you know, a physique competitor or someone that isn't considered, I guess, clinically morbidly obese. In that situation, I probably make some adjustments that may be a little bit different than what most people do. Um, I then will set uh, dietary fat somewhere-ish around 25% of their total caloric intake, um, and then I will kind of fill the rest with carbohydrates based off of their maintenance caloric intake. If they're trying to cut, I'll try to you know shave off the least amount that I possibly can, somewhere 250-ish calories away from maintenance. If they're trying to bulk, 250-ish plus over uh, maintenance. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I go from there. And then when it comes to, you know, a continued bulk or a slow bulk or a lean bulk or whatever bulking you want to call it, it's pretty much all the same things. I think the, uh, the perma bulk days are kind of over. Um, Dang it. So maybe for you. you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'll kind of make adjustments from there, but I'm trying to make as little of an adjustment as I possibly can to elicit a response of some sort. How was that? Was that decent? Yeah, That's, I just think body weight times about 13 and call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's kind of the big question when you're like setting this stuff, right? Is like, do you trust the equations, which are, which have their goods and their bads? Or do you track someone's intake and then see how their weight moves? Like both have pros and cons. Like the equations don't necessarily apply to everyone with even a small degree of accuracy they're probably 80 85 percent accurate so you might switch over and be like okay just have you have this person track their food but it's a person that's never tracked their food before and what's the accuracy on someone who's never tracked their food before 50 percent 40 percent i always lean in the direction of the equation like dom my equation is a little bit more complex than dom it has like one more step in it than his um but yeah I, I always go for the equation i think it's a better starting point in my opinion like oh he's a big guy i'm gonna do my <laughs> time <laughs> Ooh, big boy uh, big boy uh, no <laughs> he's a big boy <laughs> i am uh fucking uh no i i like that because uh I've tried to have people. I'm like, okay, let's track your intake for a week or two, and then we'll make some moves. And you just don't hear from the dude, or you check in a week later, and they're like, yeah, I didn't do that. You're like, okay. <laughs> so, like, we're back right where we started. I, I think, like, as a coach, it's the move is to just calculate it in some way. It almost doesn't matter. Like, you guys sort of pointed out before, like, coaching is interpreting data and making moves from there. Um, you could literally 
half of coaching is punching in some numbers and just being like, well, fuck, I guess. And then, <laughs> you know, seeing what happens. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's more complex than that. I'm not that, that awful. Barely. And barely. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. All right. So when we go into, like, the second part of the question. Oh, wait. Uh, I do want to. Um, God. Because. Unbelievable. Last thing, last thing, last thing. Uh, I like uh, Jason's one gram per pound protein thing. That's pretty safe and standard. But with fats, I'll do half a gram to a gram of fat per kilogram body weight, somewhere in that range. And then fill the rest with carbs. So pretty similar. Thank you for adding that. Thank you. Yeah. So Jason, one quick question. Why the 25%? Of calories and fat, what, what? How'd you settle on that number? Um, some of that was just, some of it was just based off of experience over the years. Twenty five percent seems to be what is often found in the literature. To I mean, I guess in the end of the day, the literature mostly sucks, and you could probably find arguments on both sides at the end of the day. But there seems to be quite a bit of research that suggests that a lower fat approach tends to be a little bit more efficient when it comes to fat loss. So I stick to 25%. Um, I think I came up with that number because there was that study that was a while ago from Helms and I think Schoenfeld, of course, Schoenfeld had a study. Um, and (laughs) it's safe to say that. (laughs) And, uh, they, they said, they kind of said that the lowest that you could push fat was I think 20%. So I kind of like to keep a little bit, but the thing with 20% is 20% dietary fat of your total caloric intake is kind of difficult to live with that extra 5% for whatever reason gives people a little bit more wiggle room. It's like pretty hard to find foods that are just either protein and carbs or just protein or just carbs. There's always a little bit of fat. So for whatever reason, 25% seems to be a little bit more livable and that's where I kind of like to start. Um, but that also depends on the individual. Some people just really struggle with even 25%. And I, I like to more or less work with the range. So it's not necessarily 25%. It's probably somewhere between 25% and 30%. Or if you're a physique competitor, probably the other way. Honestly, uh, 25% isn't, isn't an awful number. It's not awfully low. And I think percentages and ratios when it comes to food, like it's not a bad way to do things. And there, there are, there, there is literature that does, uh, you know, suggest diet be set up in ratios or percentages. But I, my thing with ratios and percentages is they tend to work out really well for the average person, right? With an average caloric intake or a fairly normal intake. But then we all have like, you know, clients that exist outside of the norm or have a crazy step count. And that's where ratios and percentages can get a little bit funny. Yeah. Because you do yours based off body weight, right? Grams per like my kilo starting body points are, are based off of body weight for sure. And then because ultimately at some point too, honestly, with the, the percentages, it, it's kind of like this weird range where sometimes they're a good idea for people outside of the range too. But like at some point, like if somebody is a thousand calories over their predicted maintenance or what they should be eating at their body weight for whatever reason, you know, and they have 700 grams of carbs, it may, and only like 80 grams of fat, you know, it may make more sense to, to give them more fat over time than just yeah. keep shoving carbs in there. And what I wonder <laughs> and even like is, somebody, sorry, I wonder, it, I wonder how close these people that you have going off, what did you say? 0.5 grams per kilo? Uh, 0.5 to 0.1. So what I'll normally do to is, 1.0. Yeah. Okay. Or 1.0. My bad. Yeah. Um, it starts somewhere in the middle, like around 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8, 75, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then see how things go. If we're in a circumstance where it's like, oh, like you're losing weight and that's not what we want to do, we can add more food. Then I start pushing them towards that one gram 
per kilogram. And if we get far enough into an improvement season or a bulk or whatever we're doing, I'll even go above that because ultimately like when we start dieting, I, I want to have plenty of fat to pull from, you know? I wonder if that I puts them that, in that like 20 to 30% range. I wonder if like the 0.5 would represent like 20% and then the 1.0 would represent like 30%. I think it would, I would have to crunch the maths. But I, I think pretty, even, uh, I did it on 3,000 calories just now and 25% was like 80 ish grams yeah. of fat. Okay. So Jay, it probably, because somebody who's maybe about 90 kilograms probably eats around 3000 or just over the average person. Yeah. Yeah. I usually, cause that's why I say it kind of depends on the individual that you're working with a little bit, it's even with things like protein intake. So if you're working with a client that's, you know, morbidly obese and they weigh 300 plus pounds, I'm not going to give them 300 grams of protein and even in that situation. <laughs> But I mean, dude, that's part of coaching. Like we have these numbers. Like, what? <laughs> that's part of coaching is we have these numbers, but you don't always apply them because you look down at this piece of paper and you look at the client and you're like, this just doesn't fucking make sense. This person does not need this. Um, In that situation, I would use like a pretty unorthodox way of coming up with protein intake. And it may sound wacky. Grams, is it right? Don't do that. <laughs> I'll tell you what that I number do. Up. Those are rookie <laughs> numbers. I, I'll uh, I'll tell you what I do. If I have somebody who like, I'm like, dude, this guy looks like he's 30 percent body fat, 40. Like this guy is obese. I do a rough estimation for what their body fat probably would, or for what their body weight probably would be at at something more reasonable, like 15 percent or 20 percent. I'll do something like I'll even ask some people and usually it applies a little bit more to women than it does to men. And I'll even ask them a series of questions like, what is your goal weight? And I might use the goal weight to determine their protein intake. What was your weight in high school? Because often high school is probably a goody, pretty good determination of what their scale weight should have been before things got off the rails a little bit. That's yeah, also depending on being, being a piece of shit and not getting <laughs> jacked like they should. <laughs> right, right. So, <laughs> but, but that seems to be a pretty good place because most of us, I mean, there are, granted, things have changed by a good amount. So maybe not these days quite as much, but uh, there was a good time where there were times where most people tended to be pretty thin-ish right around their the time that they graduated high school. They leave high school, they go to college, they start going to keggers, things get way out of control. And at that same time, your behavior greatly changes right after high school for most people. So that high school scale weight tends to be pretty close. So I have, like, I have a few like questions that I'll ask and I'll probably end up somewhere in between the, in the middle of all of those things. Yeah. That question seems inflammatory. Yeah. What was that, your high school that weight? would bounce back hard at me. <laughs> I but, but I don't just... <laughs> But I don't have like a clipboard. I'm just running down some. I'll just be like, yeah. So, or I'll ask like, when, show what? Show me your, your yearbook weight? picture. What <laughs> happened what your, to you? Where did what it was all your go scale wrong? Weight? When you felt that you looked your best, what was your scale weight? Sixth grade. Sixth grade for <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> all right, I got a two parter here. On the topic of low fat intake, I remember when the Isratel effect hit. We'll call it that. Yesterday. And Mike Isertel and Broderick were big on like the low fat dieting. And people were like, oh, yeah, low fat, high carb. I read that as no fat, maximum carb. And there were a couple Isretel lights that I follow <laughs> that were like posting their daily macros. And they were like, yeah, man, got my got my dietary fats down to 12 grams a day. Really feeling primed. And I was like, oh, man, give it a month. And a month later, they're like. Training isn't what I thought it would be. Like my sleep's all fucked up. I don't feel good. My dick don't work no more. Yeah, Dude, well, I feel best funny. around like fifty, which I feel like is pretty low to the normal person. Fucking, uh, <laughs> there are hormonal yeah, no, considerations that you are exempt from. Huh? Uh, oh. Wait, what? <laughs> So, like, uh, yeah, Broderick, I think his fat recommendations are similar to the numbers that I use. 
And for some reason, everybody still called him a low fat guy. And it's like, he's, he's not a low he's fat not. guy. He's yeah. like a normal fat guy. Like if you're a hundred <laughs> kilograms, he's a normal he's fat that guy. He's <laughs> a normal fat guy. <laughs> Isn't yeah, it like yeah. 0.3 to 0.7 times your scale weight? Is that what his is? I think Does that sound about right. That ends yeah. up being pretty close to what you say. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but no, I remember, uh, we, there was this trend, uh, among some internet friends of Tom and mine's mine. And, uh, there were some guys that were eating like four or 5,000 calories a day, but like 50 grams of fat, you know, just <laughs> trace fats. And, uh, I was like, Oh shit, this is the secret to getting like yoked and lean at the same time. And I just like felt awful, stayed fat. Like it, it wasn't good insulin response it's all about that insulin response again that might be another example of like something that works well in enhanced individuals like bleeding over into like the natural bodybuilding crowd without any other consideration there and then kind of having some some negative ramifications it probably doesn't even work well for them the, the <laughs> explanation probably is just like well, fuck, you're actually still just eating less because you're you're missing a whole macronutrient almost. <laughs> like <laughs> I did the twenty percent and I think I might have gone quite a bit below that when I was doing you know, that's when I was learning all the things at the same time. So I was dieting on like Pop Tarts and weird macro friendly pizzas and just uh, like just a weird diet. And I would try to seek out the things that had very little dietary fat. Like Pop Tarts have like a good amount of fat, I think. Or maybe it's like five grams. grams of fat. It's like five. Yeah. yeah. So I would get my fat from like uh, whatever was in Pop Tarts, uh, baked Lay's <laughs> potato chips. Uh, it was <laughs> like uh, turkey pepperoni. It was like this weird <laughs> diet. And I was eating like 3,500 calories and I got shredded, but I felt terrible. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't you matter. looked great. You looked <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> All right, let's hit this next question. Our next question comes from Liz Bumberger. Again, very easy Instagram name here at Liz Bumberger. Liz asks, What supplements would you say are the most important for a lifestyle client to take? So, what are some kind of bare bones? Minimum supplements that you throw at your lifestyle clients. Dom's our big supplement guy, especially on the health supplement side. Health supplement lecture in the mentoring lab. Quit sleeping. Dom, give them a little snippet of that. Don't give them all of it. Do give I it all away one, for free. Like just give them one? <laughs> yeah, just one. Tic Tacs. D3. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like every person on earth should take D3. What if you're getting a lot of sunlight? Uh, then you <laughs> probably don't train a lot because you're in the sun all day long. Naked? Probably. <laughs> Should be in the gym all day. No, but I think vitamin D3 is probably like the most important lifestyle client supplement to take. Even even everybody, actually. Especially like uh, anybody northern latitude because sunlight's not as like prominent and then we're covered up most of the time uh what else what's another one I, a good fish oil is a good one too with a good epa dha ratio are you a fish oil or a krill oil kind of guy because there's a little bit of debate in the supplemento sphere about that um i like krill oil but it all really depends on where the fish oil is coming from so uh, I use krill oil and I use uh, Nordic Naturals uh, or Mega 3s, just either one. I go back and forth between the two. I because really I think the issue with, with low quality fish oil is that a lot of the fatty acids get oxidized if, yeah. it's, if it is kind of low. How do you actually tell the difference? You personally, how do you tell the difference between like a low quality and a high quality um, fish oil Dude, sometimes oil you can supplement. just tell by packaging. Like, that stuff oxidizes if it sees sunlight. Um, you know, you want, like, darker gels. So, like, the gel stays shaded. Uh, what like, about fishy burps? Is that is that bad? They have burp-free ones. I oh, swear those don't work. I swear those don't coated. work. I, I don't still know what get they're burpy. coated with, but they... Uh, or, like, lemon-flavored ones. 
Oh. They need to just burp up lemon and fish. It's the worst. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Two things should never be mixed together. Oh. Lemon. All right. That's fish. normal to squeeze some lemon on your fish. That's true. I just thought sure. about that. But when you burp That's it up. Not- Burp it up. Mm. Burp it up. It's like fish oil and like lemon pledge mixed. I remember when uh, when the plague was getting popular. Um, vitamin D three was like the big talk of the town because it's oh, like yeah, it's very yeah, immune. Yeah. It helps your immune system a lot, like immune response, cytokine response. Um, so I was reading into here in Michigan, they did like, like a cohort study. And it was something like 68% of people that came into the hospital were vitamin D insufficient. Like, that's a lot. <laughs> I think that kind of, I I was reading some numbers that were either worldwide or in the U.S. And the numbers were pretty similar. You said close to 70% were yeah, like insufficient, insufficient or deficient. And then like yeah. out of the 70, it was like half were deficient. I've I mean, never. Going back to our I mean, episode I mean, with Zaryu, do your dailies. Get outside. Get that sun directly on your skin. Here's a vitamin D absorption question. Does the amount of skin that is in contact with with the sun, does that influence the amount of vitamin D that you get? Well, fuck, Ryan. I mean, considering that's what that's the goal is to get your skin under the sun. It it probably, maybe. You came at me like you were going to have a definite answer there. But then you even started doubting yourself halfway through and you dropped it probably. When I say probably, maybe, that's like (laughs) for sure. (laughs) I think the recommendations on vitamin D are based off of exposure to sun in the nude. I I think you just made that up. Did you just make no, that? No, I think I think Schoenfeld has a study where they got some people <laughs> nude, and it's, then it's Schoenfeld and Dave Asprey on the well, study. Well, if you think about it, sunlight it starts that process. Uh, so if there's more surface area covered by sunlight, I guess you'd see more of that process happening. I think like solar cells. At the end of the day, like your skin is kind of like a solar cell. I'm just going to use a terrible. <laughs> terrible way to explain this but if there's it's like more a of your tesla. skin it makes it's like a tesla <laughs> inside joke but uh if there's more of your skin exposed to the sun it seems like you would absorb more d3 like if, if you were completely covered up and just your hand was out do you think you could absorb more d3 with just your hand or your entire body i, I, I like I mean, to think of it, it makes as sense. like <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Paul was going to say that. I would like to think of it as it's like a girl, right? You go out maximally covered, you're getting no D. The the less you wear, the more D you get. The more attention you get. <laughs> no D. All this the D. Just a purely vitamin D three conversation huh? right here. What about vitamin D two? You know, I go to the grocery store. Isn't I go to the supplement plant? store. I see vitamin D2 on the shelf. It's a lot cheaper. I'm going to go for that one instead. Save myself some D Nero. No, just buy D3. <laughs> Why? Why? Because three Ds are better than two. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Full circle. We came right back to it. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Get vitamin D3. It's more bioavailable. There we go. That was the answer that you were looking for. Body uses more of it. Better for you. All right. So we got vitamin D. Some omega fatty acids. Paul, you want to talk a little bit on, on creatine? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mostly fuck that one. Mostly, probably, maybe, I think. Creatine mono, five grams a day. One of the more researched ones. Definitely can't hurt. Probably will help. Probably won't help too much. Definitely but. can't hurt. Definitely won't notice. <laughs> <laughs> You're killing everyone's placebo effect. <laughs> what else? What else we got? Jay, anything you recommend? Uh, what about like a nice multivitamin? I would say multi-mineral over multivitamin. You're just coming I in with these like heaters? I need an explanation. Why, Don? <laughs> Why? Because most people, if let's say they just track macros, they'll lack minerals more than they lack vitamins so i would rather give them a full spectrum multi-mineral 
rather that like if they had to be like yo i need to buy one and i can only buy one i would tell them buy the multi-mineral because multi-minerals a lot of them are coenzymes for a lot of things in our body and if they're lacking them because their diet's horrible and they're eating pop tarts all the time and are you also basing that off of the fact that most grains most like flexible dieting ifym friendly foods are fortified and enriched with vitamins uh yes and no i mean just meat in general has a lot of vitamins um you know that kind of stuff hopefully they get like a serving of fruit a day um i think I've, it's been a while but i think i've seen some research where like people even eating western diets get more vitamins than they would think yeah and i'm halfway sold on dom's idea because i haven't taken a multivitamin in years and, and you are the pinnacle of health worst killer diet, killer <laughs> Huh? <laughs> what? You said you're the you're the pinnacle of human health. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. but think about it. Think about these multivitamins that they sell. They have like I don't know five thousand percent the daily value of like water soluble vitamins that you're just gonna end up pissing Isn't out that better? and wasting. And then big number. All those fat soluble ones that they have in there. They they have the smallest amount of them in there. So. You, you, I, I would see no point in taking it. Not okay. no point, but you know what I mean. You, limited, limited benefit. Yeah, because like they're always like that. They're always like ten percent your daily value of vitamin D, but ten thousand percent your B twelve. <laughs> they do that, and then you're like, ah, my pee is a, such a strange color. Yeah, I don't know why uh, it turned no, into like no, Mario no, right my there. Pee's been, like, ah, my pee. Green. My my pee's neon green. Is everything okay? <laughs> <laughs> I had a I had a client start taking like beetroot powder before his workouts, and he messaged me and he was like, "Hey, so just got finished up at the doctor. Like some really weird stuff was going on. Like I was pooping out like pure red. Like I thought I was pooping out blood. So like had to get the doctor to like you know check where my poop was coming from. That's your booty hole, if you guys didn't know." Um, and I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. What did he say? Like, oh, nothing's wrong. I was like, the beetroot powder, how much have you been taking? He's like, oh, I don't really measure it. I add like two big tablespoons in there, which is like 30 grams when you're supposed to take three grams. I was like, all right, wow. easy way to avoid having another man's fingers in your butt is to measure your beetroot powder moving forward. Is the powder red? It is. Very. It's weird how people can't figure that shit out, you know? <laughs> Like, because you know, it's fucking crazy to me. Like, once upon a time when I was a child, dude, my mom bought some red velvet cake. First time I ever had red velvet cake. So I ate so much of that red velvet cake. Shit red, first thought was, gotta be the fucking red velvet cake. Hold on, so, Paul. Did you know, what does red velvet taste like to you? Um, like fucking red velvet cake. Don't call it chocolate. It it's, is it's, different. It's chocolate. With it's chocolate. red food color. No, dude, it tastes different for sure, one hundred percent. Not maybe. It probably not, tastes um, different though, because it's like cream cheese. Uh, yeah, like frosting. Dude, Did you guys there know that is all something Skittles else different taste the about same? it. I know, Did they, you know that? they add stuff to chocolate, and it's not just goddamn food color. It's, it's red, is what they add to chocolate. Paul. That's how they it's get red. you with the color. Red, same red thing red with smell. Skittles. All Skittles taste the same. They smell different, and they're a different color, but they actually taste. The exact same. Fact check really? me. Go to fucking Snopes. Is that what it's called? True. Snipes? Snopes? No. Snipes? Snopes? Snopes? One of those. Snipes. There's Do no all way Skittles. that's true. What is that? There they are. I don't know. It's like a fact checking thing. Oh, no. Oh. All right. Bear with me as Boo freaks out. All right. Um, so we've handled kind of like the general health supplements for a lifestyle client. What kind of supplements would you recommend in the like pre slash post peri workout nutrition window? Does that stuff really? The most important thing, like the most important part of your day. Clearly. Yeah. What would you recommend? What supplements? <laughs> Uh, food. Food. Okay. So have a nice meal. Anything outside of the meal? 
maybe some beta alanine, maybe some citrulline malate, maybe some caffeina, maybe some cocaina. Okay, wait. Get, answer this question. Perry workout, that is that includes the food you eat around your workout as well. So that should include like sort of pre, during, and post, right? Yeah, pre is all around. I just wanted to clarify that and make sure. Oh, yeah. So definition. pre-workout nutrition, I think we've kind of came to the conclusion, doesn't do too much because it takes hours to digest food. And then intra-workout. No, pre-workout is, it, it's not that it doesn't do anything. I mean, it still does something. But the thing about pre-workout food is it makes food timing during and post-workout less relevant. Depending because you're on the digesting of that food. Meal. Yeah. Yeah. So my whole thing understanding was pre-workout food should be just enough to maintain blood sugar while you're training. And then you can dabble with intra-workout nutrition if you think you need carbohydrates for your one-hour resistance training. And then <laughs> – your post workout nutrition. How dare you? <laughs> your post workout nutrition. Again, just a, just a good meal. I, I think it's really uh, overdone. You can simplify it. You can stress less about it, and that's a good thing. We just learned from our podcast with Matt Cassano, keeping the stress levels low, stressing about those supplements. It's going to come and bite you in the ass because it's that total stress load that we're working with here. Is anyone looking up the Skittles thing? <laughs> no. I was if no one looked it up, it's velvet. true, right? All right, we're going to go with the that. The red velvet thing, it is different. Okay, It's not different. Yeah. Red velvet is it chocolate. It is, dude. Ball. It's red not from dye. It's red from a chemical reaction of, of acidic ingredients like vinegar and fucking butter. What? Shit. So red velvet yes, is vinegar dude, flavor? I just looked it up. So Salt cheap red velvet cake. cake is just chocolate cake. There is red cocoa food. in it. But there is cocoa in not, it? Yes. It's chocolate. Chocolate? Yeah, there is some chocolate, but it's not just fucking chocolate cake, man. <laughs> right, it's chocolate, red, and velvet. It's no, those three dude, things. The red isn't from dye. <laughs> Why is it called red like velvet? It? Maybe like Walmart brand red velvet cake is. <laughs> Anyways. So my, my thing with the, the Perry workout nutrition, like, like when people talk about how important it is and, and whatever, everything is conditional and, and relevant to, to whatever you're doing, your lifestyle, your meal planning. So if you have a giant meal a couple hours pre-workout, you know, steak, fucking potatoes, and uh, you know, it's a high fatty steak and broccoli and shit, that may make – timing for your next meal a lot less relevant because or your intro workout were less relevant because of the the rate of digestion and how long you're going to have aminos and glucose and all that stuff in your bloodstream um and available to use but like if somebody wakes up and they don't like eating pre-workout it may not be a bad idea to have an intro and a post-workout you know or if you got really busy with work and it's been five, six, seven hours since your last meal, an intra probably isn't the worst idea, you know? So it, it all just sort of depends. If you have a smaller pre-workout meal, you want to make sure you're covered. Or, you know, you use certain special sports supplement, supplements that, you know, um, impact your glucose control and what you're doing with that. Then, you know, things change. But would you agree with Don that the main goal of that peri workout nutrition is just stabilizing blood glucose? Um, depending on, on the circumstance, I think that's an aspect uh, for sure. And, and you don't need many carbs to do that. Like at any one point in time, I think the average person has like four grams of, of glucose in their blood. So you need a very small amount. I think Lyle McDonald's recommends something like 10 grams right for for uh average bodybuilding workout um but in the circumstance where somebody's fasted um i don't know that it's critical or crucial but maybe having some some amino acid mixture in there might not be a bad idea 
amino acids like branch chains or essential or full spectrum. I would probably go with essential, um, you know, because of all we know about the difference between the NPS response of branch chains versus um, the essentials and stuff. And then I, if somebody were in a fasted state too and they wanted to have uh, maybe some sort of medium chain triglyceride fat content pre-workout, like I, I wouldn't be against that. I, I don't know that it's needed or, or crucial or critical, but maybe not like a bad idea. Jay, you're going to be blind in like two years. That computer screen is the brightest computer screen I've ever seen in my life. It's actually a combination of there's a light here that's on top of the monitor that Jay's keeps like, all there's like who a, said that there's a, there's a bunch <laughs> of lights that allow me to stare at this very bright computer screen without my eyes falling back in my head. But I looked into the Skittles thing. It turns out that they did a blind taste test. Um, and let's see. Is this peer reviewed? Is this a Schoenfeld study? <laughs> Well, uh, there's a fellow named neuroscientist, Don oh. Katz, PhD. So there's a okay. neuroscientist here's who gets enough money. He gets funded to have people taste Skittles. That's my primary concern. Who cares? Uh, but he said that Skittles, uh, I guess the conclusion is Skittles have different fragrances and different colors, but they all taste exactly the same. Yes. But yes. here's my thing. Doesn't, doesn't, your, doesn't smell affect taste oh 100 percent. right bigger yeah. thing bigger issue bigger issue it almost doesn't matter because skittles are an ass candy that's not true that is not true skittles are that's, a great I candy true. that's very mm. garbage nah, debatable Trash. that's heavy, that's right. heavily debatable okay what's a yeah. what's a better one like are we talking like a better sweet candy yeah just anything with chocolate is anything better. sour yeah i'd better. rather eat an m&m over a skittle Ugh. Yeah. I mean, oh. you're, uh, that's apples oranges. We're going sweet sour oh, I, here. Okay, I'd rather mm-hmm. eat Swedish fish over a Skittle. Oh my god! Oh. Sour Patch Kids <laughs> are pretty solid. What the fuck? What's next? Circus sour peanuts? Patch kids sour Patch Kids about- are these are pretty good, and you can put them on Froyo, and they're even better. Mm-hmm. I don't Delicious. like I don't like Sour Patch on my Froyo because like they you also they don't like the yogurt, pizza. and it's too they hard. Like a lot of things. Yeah, you don't like pizza. You made a I'm sandwich a man of with particular ham tastes. and goober. Have you ever you had, had a goober and ham sandwich? You no, have the taste. It did, it did look delicious. <laughs> I mean, right? You have a, the taste buds of a deprived North Korean child. Paul, I've seen like, what you eat, and I've seen what comes out of you, and you can't. We can't have this conversation right now, sir. We can. We cannot. What comes out of me is a lot because I really fucking like food. Oh, it's so it's so bad. It seems so bad and so unhealthy. But Paul is just cruising right along. You're an impressive. I think both of your tastes are questionable. Both of your tastes are questionable. Remember the time that Ryan said he that he drank uh, chocolate water. Remember that. So everybody, chocolate I want you to water? go back. And think, was it chocolate water? You said you. Oh, uh, you wanted to drink water. Chocolate. Oreo. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's because milk is water. for babies and beer is for yeah. men. That's true. Weird. <laughs> yeah. I think that was uh, from the book of Schwarzenegger, 420. A great passage. Now, if you dip your Oreos in beer, like, I'm not saying that's that's a great thing, but I could look at you and be like, I can respect that. Like, what kind you of know? beer? Like a Bud Heavy? Then chug my butt and with my Oreo crust if you're, in if it. you're dipping your Oreos in beer, you can use whatever fucking beer you want, dude. All right. Next time you come down here and we're over at Whiskey Business, we're going to have myself a nice beer. And we're going to stop at Wawa, get some Oreos, and we're going to test this thing. How are okay. Oreos and beer? I'm here for it. All right. I'll be there. Liz, that one went off the rails. Hopefully you got some value from that. <laughs> Next question comes from Rachel Pollard. At the underscore incredible underscore Rach. Uh, she asks night sweats during prep for a natural competitor. So we specified natural because there are some compounds in the enhanced realm that will make you quite sweaty at night. We'll remove those. Why might a natural competitor 
suffer from those night sweats? Is it like a thermoregulation issue? Is it a low energy availability? Side effect of fat loss? I've always suspected, and I haven't looked into this, that it's just a thermoregulation thing because most competitors during prep will notice those large swings in body temperature. But that's just my theory. Are they, Dude, I will, is Yohimbian natural hmm. still? No. So Yohimbian is on the water list. So is Ephedra. Yeah, no, Ephedrine. I got no comment. <laughs> no comment. No idea. Jay? Probably dying. Yo, like last night, for the first time in my life, I woke up covered in sweat, dude, and I was so tired and it felt so wrong. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. But I was so tired. I just went back to bed and I woke up and I was like, I think that I almost died or something last night. That made no sense. (laughs) It's a stroke. That that made no sense. uh, Estrogen levels can cause night sweats. Hmm? Yeah, Yeah, when they go meno, when females go meno. Yeah, so maybe... Maybe this natural competitor had some hormone regulation issues and might have saw some night sweats because of that. Yeah, yeah. maybe I'm going through menopause. <laughs> Absolutely. That makes sense. <laughs> I've Jay, never had were night you ever sweats. A sweaty I've boy? Never, no, huh? I've never encountered night sweats, and I don't think I've ever worked with anybody that had night sweats outside of somebody that was menopausal, like Dom said, which is a really good point. I've never. I had night sweats once, but it had nothing to do with bodybuilding at all. It was like getting over pneumonia. That was the only time. And that was real. That was not enjoyable. Night sweats. Night sweats suck because you just wake up and you're like, I remember waking up and just being in a pool of sweat and just being like, uh, so what do I do now? And then I just go to the closet, like get another sleep shirt because, you know, I like to sleep. I almost sleep like, like a Persian prince. Like I like to wear like the full robe, you know? (laughs) A nice linen, and then I just have to change that out. But yeah, I've never encountered night sweats at any given time. I just get really cold. That's about it. But never enough to have night sweats. That's weird. Here's a possible scenario. Maybe this individual is getting on the leaner side, and they're very cold going to bed at night. So they grab all the blankets in their house, throw them all over them, fall asleep. They warm up as the night goes, get all sweaty. Pull them all off, get really cold again, throw them back on, get sweaty again. Maybe but it's that's just not like night sweats. It sweats at night. It's technically yeah, but night sweats. sweats. When I think of night sweats, I'm thinking of like a physiological response to something. Uh, not, sometimes I had too many covers on. <laughs> sometimes, uh, like if somebody goes hypo, so it, it may have something to do with their ability to yeah. like manage blood glucose, or maybe they have a carb heavy meal at night um, and go reactive hypo in their sleep, potentially. I don't know. Yeah, it could be that. That's possible. That's. I think that's probably, of the things that we've said, I think that's the most likely. That sounds the best to me at face value, is that it's something Because I'm like the hypo. smartest one. Well, if well she's, let's not so take if it she's, too far. If she's really lean, really deep into contest prep, maybe... Her stress hormones are probably super high. Her other hormones are probably dropping. You might have a little bit of hypothalamus response, controls your temperature. So she might start sweating at night. Guys, this is like the most value that I think we've ever provided on a question. And we all went in not knowing what the hell was going on. We're just, th- we're thinkers. We're we really think- are. We really are. If, if there was any time to play this, I think it's now. That's it. Great job, job guys. Anymore. Great job. <laughs> Play it. Can you hear that? No. Is that only no. playing on my end? Can you hear people cheering for oh, you? Cool. All right. Oh, oh great. Oh, that was a that was a bust. That was a bust. It didn't work. <laughs> no. Oh, huh, maybe it'll come through on the recording. Who knows? Riverside.fm. We're giving it a shot. There's your shout out. All right. Last question for the day comes from another one. Luke Mauger. Instagram name at Luke Mauger or Mauger. I honestly don't know how to pronounce it. Shame on me. All right. Luke asks, how popular will HRT for men in the years be? How popular will HRT be for men 
in the years to come. So we've kind of seen an upswing in the popularity over the last 10, 10 15 years. years. Will this increase in popularity continue its ex exponential rise, or will we kind of see a leveling off at some point? Well, since the COVID vaccine is actually a ploy of the government to lower your testosterone, no, I can't hear anything. I think it will. Uh... You guys can't hear me. Well, we just got immediately demonetized. You brought up the two things that we're not allowed to ever talk about. <laughs> I'm kidding. Take it back. <laughs> Can you, not, that out, can you not hear us? I can't hear anything. So you guys just keep answering the question. Keep doing your damn thing. Can't you uh, just unplug your headphones your and headphones. use the speakers in your computer like a normal person? What? Now I can hear you. Oh, uh, there we go. Did you not hear me when I was asking the question? No, we could. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we could hear you. Oh, well, that's the important part. Yeah, yeah, so, so Paul, Paul was just saying how it's a government ploy to lower all men's testosterone. Oh. Um, with, the, with the COVID vaccine. With the vaccine. So. So. And <laughs> we're kicked immediately off. Immediately demonetized. <laughs> <laughs> Do you that? think it's interesting? Like, yeah, Paul started you guys... to say those two things, and immediately Ryan's mics or, uh, earbuds <laughs> and mics stop working, like, right off the bat. They're listening. Mm -hmm. Big Brother's listening. Hmm? Can't you guys like bleep me like I said a cuss word and put like a blurry thing over my mouth? Can't we just trust you? Uh -huh. Can't we just trust you? <laughs> you don't want us to be demonetized though. Yeah, honestly, the entirety of what Gifted Performance is will crumble if we don't have all this ad <laughs> revenue that comes rolling in. If we lose that, we are, we're done. What is it? Section 12? Is that bankruptcy? We need to Absolutely. declare for that. I, hate um, uh, I think it'll get more popular, but I don't think it'll get too popular because I think there's still taboo in it. And and a lot of insurances don't cover it. So a lot of people don't like spending the money. And I, I've had, I had a friend go to an HRT clinic and they worked up his blood and everything. And he was like, he was pretty low. He was probably... I think it was like 105 at like 32 years old too, pretty young. And uh, they worked up like a protocol for him and everything. And man, it had like every peptide you could think of, <laughs> every, <laughs> anything. And his bill was like 6,500. And I was like, let me see that invoice. <laughs> I told him, you don't need this. You don't need this. You don't need this. You don't need this. And I got, you know, then he just got uh, his normal his normal stuff and his bill went down to like 350. So there, there are some that are a bit sh like money hungry to the people who don't know any better. And honestly, if he didn't have me as a friend, he would have probably just paid it. <laughs> and the prices have been going up though. When I first started TRT, most clinics were like 200 bucks. Now they are 300, 350. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Is it 200 bucks? I know nothing about TRT. Is it 200 bucks for like, what are we talking here? Is that just like the entirety of your life you pay 200 bucks or is it like a membership yeah, fee? Yeah, at these clinics, um, basically for – depending on the clinic. Some of them are run differently, but a lot of them you get your month of, of drugs, but that 200 also includes your uh, like biannual blood work and doctor visits with them. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that it – 350 for uh, just his – prescription for 20 weeks worth of it and then That's not bad. yeah every time he gets blood work done it's another 300 um and but i'm taking him to a different clinic just because of what they did Dude, the first time that yeah that's really not bad though 350 for 20 weeks. like i literally pay a little over 200 bucks for like a month yeah yeah, and they literally they send me a five milliliter bottle of testosterone every month. I think you'll see HRT getting more. Oh, this is for men, but I think you'll start seeing it get more popular for women soon too. Um, as they, you know, as the understanding comes out more and more, people get vocal about it. Um, I think you'll start seeing more HRT for women. Yeah, I think we're kind of seeing like a big <clears throat> boost in it now, just because. Uh, the baby boomer generation has reached that age where this might be a concern. There's just a lot of them. 
right? Because they would be 50-ish around this time. So that's probably why it's it's seen some popularity as of late, just because, you know, that generation of men are mainly men and they probably don't want to see a decline in certain things, performance on a number of different levels. So there's probably going to be an increase of that. I don't know if we would see an increase of it in the future, just because, yeah, it is, there is a bit of a taboo behind it, but in that same vein, there's a lot of people not taking care of themselves. So I think if physicians had the mindset of it's better, for, like the the potential ramifications of having poor health related to low hormone production is probably far worse than the potential side effects of TRT, then we would see an upswing. So maybe it will get more popular because you might get more doctors that are just more open-minded. I think so. And I think a lot of doctors are finding how uh, – lucrative it can be but i like your point on on the generational differences right because i feel like my generation is a lot more open to it than my father's generation so my father's generation it's just fucking weird you don't want to get stabbed with a needle all the time or stab yourself you know like getting old and having low testosterone is normal you know that's like the their mindset and we're we're trying to fight that you know my my generation so Here's an interesting piece. I actually had someone, a friend of mine, text me yesterday. He went to an HRT clinic just because he was in the same building as his work. And his uh, total test came back at, I think it was 598 uh, nanograms per deciliter. And they told him, yeah, like your test is way too low for someone your age. Like we need to start you on cream and we need to start you on HCG like as soon as possible. Same thing as Dom, like this big long list of like peptides, injectable B12, carnitine, this, that, and the other. So if there is kind of like a drop off in popularity at some point, it just, it might just be because of how money hungry and like unethical these people are. Cause like for those who don't know, 598 nanograms per deciliter is like smack dab in the middle of the range for someone who's like 32, 33 years old. That's like a really good number to see. Yeah. yeah. That's sad. That sucks. Yeah. yeah. So he was like, cause real life, he was like, oh, like what would be, he's like, what would be the negatives of starting what they told me to take? I was like, there, there probably wouldn't be any negatives. You're just shutting down what is already a perfectly functioning system. Honestly, he might end so, up actually lower. lower. Well, well, here's the thing is, is there, there actually are plenty of negatives. Like one, you're, you're shutting down your system for no reason. So that's a negative. Um, but two, a lot of times, like the doses that HRT clinics prescribe, um, sound normal on paper, but have abnormal responses. And so he may end up with high red blood cell count, have to donate more, increases risk of having a stroke or something like that, you know, from increased, uh, blood viscosity or whatever. So like, yeah, when you have normal testosterone, the raising your, your testosterone levels two, three, 400 points, like probably isn't going to make you feel much different, but it's probably going to definitely, at least to some degree, increase certain risks. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, some of the doses, cause I sat down and I had a, I had like coffee the other day, uh, the other day with a, a friend's dad who was same exact thing. I RT clinic. They're running him through the ringer and they haven't taken, uh, I think they had him taking like 200 milligrams of test testosterone, like an one of the longer ester tests. And they had him taking it like once every 14 days. And he was like, he's like, I would feel like really good the first couple days. And then like, I would just completely feel like garbage until like the next time, like I went to see them. And it's like, so where are you getting these re- – as the doctor, where are you getting those recommendations? How is that your recommendation? Like I think that's, like that's based, based, off based off of really old thing. literature because exactly. that's kind of how these were designed was to have um, patients inject less frequently by attaching longer esters. But they didn't consider the drop-off rate with the half-lives 
as the person progresses through. That's why Sustanon was made because they wanted to offer a once a month injection that would, because of all the different esters, it would cover through and they wouldn't feel this crash. But even that, they, they don't even use Sustanon anymore for that. No, Undecano 8 is the new long one. Where yeah. You can, there are several different protocols. But no, you're right. And that's the reason why so many people go to clinics is because you're like, you know, your average physician or whatever, they just sort of read the pamphlet or the information that they Google and they sort of see like, oh, on paper, you should be able to give this once every 14 days and it should work out. And in practice, it doesn't. And uh, yeah, they're just not very schooled in it. And so these HRT clinics that specialize in, in, in these protocols, they, uh, they, they actually know what they're doing for the most part, but they also try and, you know, someone pull a fast one on you and try to rip you off. So yeah, HRT might get more popular in the years to come, but with an increase in popularity, um, I would expect an increase in people kind of getting into the industry, just looking for that quick buck and maybe they're not as educated as they should be. So buyer beware it's getting easier too like, like now you can do all the shit online yeah yeah, yeah uh, he, Way more my friend didn't even go into the office he did it all online crazy crazy well luke if you're looking at hrt be careful maybe talk to one of these experts down here before you go that route that concludes us today that's all four questions what else do we cover today skittles they actually don't have flavors. They're just different smells. That is verified by a doctor, a PhD, yeah. who is getting funding, probably from like the government or something, to conduct this research. HRT clinics, beware. What else do we go over? The science right. of E3 macros. Is chocolate. As Paul said, it's basically guessing and then looking and being like, oh shit, and changing stuff. Those are the big takeaways for me. What were the big takeaways for you guys? Uh, red velvet is chocolate. 100%. Red food. <laughs> <laughs> and the last piece that we all can easily glean from this episode is that of the individuals on this podcast, I have the most refined palate, and that is undisputed. If you'd like to dispute it, take it directly to my DMs, and you can catch these hands. We'll see you on the next one. Until then... And as always, stay gifted. Deuces. Bye. Bye. Oh, oh. Love it, Jay.